sadly, I can't keep the Garrick helm on and have the headset on. But, you know, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the Spirit Awards before we go down to the floor. Uh, teams who came here and displayed the national pride. Uh, the Dominican team came in with the Garrick pelts and the Garrick helms, uh, the Uruguayan team, the Guatemalan team, uh, all uh, were given Spirit Awards this weekend. Uh, you know, great job by them. But, uh, and I have one piece of bookkeeping before we go down to the floor for our feature match. Uh, it was reported that there was a draw between Denmark and uh, Argentina, but it was not a draw. Okay. Denmark won, which means in their in their pool, Denmark and Mexico are locked for the top 16. Exciting to see them get through. Yeah, but we are ready to go down to the floor and watch some action between Portugal and Brazil. So let's send it right down to the floor. Hello and welcome to the final round of the first wave of pool play here at the World Magic Cup on day two. I'm Brian David Marshall. I'm joined by Pro Tour champion Ben Stark, and we are watching. Uh, there'll be no there'll be no hidden language here. The Brazilian team versus versus the Portuguese <laughs> team. Everyone's speaking the same language. There you see Willie Edel, the captain of the Brazilian team, and really the 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 godfather of Brazilian magic. Yeah, from what I hear, he's been instrumental in the growing the Brazilian magic community. And there you see Hugo Alexandre Fernandez Dinas, who is his opponent this round. And he is from Portugal. And, you know, there's not a lot of experience uh, left on the Portuguese team. There's only three players left. Uh, we had a uh, disqualification yesterday for one of their team members, their team captain. Uh, these three guys are the only ones left. They'll be playing all the way through. Uh, and Hugo, his, really, his pro experience, he's got two Grand Prix. That's about it. Yeah, well, you know, Willie only has four PT top eights. <laughs> That's about it. So we're looking at um, Willie Adele has green, blue, and black, a Soul Tide deck. That's the first one of those I think I've seen in uh, the three team sealed rounds. Uh, Soul Tide doesn't seem very popular. And, and he, has, he has the natural Salte on uh, turn three there to play a morph. Uh, a couple wet lane sandbars collided. Uh, Hugo sort of restocked with a uh, Highland game, but did not have a third land. And Hugo looks to be playing Timor, something we see out of almost every single team right. field. Right. Because the blue-green tempo synergy ha is just so great. When right. you have multiple Savage punches and force aways and, uh, you know, uh, four power guys and... Sagu Maulers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if Sagu Maulers is synergistic per se. It's just a blue green gold rare that's yeah. not a mythic and is an incredible card. Tur turn three, Tusk Guard. I've uh, turned four, Tusk Guard Captain for Hugo. Willie Adel has a Salty Charm, knocks it out of the way, and bashes him with a morph. Uh, we, I think we know that morph is a, a, an abomination of Gadul. Yes, we do. There you see it on your screen. And there you see Icy Blast uh, in uh, Willie's hand, hand for Willie. Dragon Scale Boon and Treasure Cruise. An Abomination Gadul Treasure Cruise is an awfully nice uh, combination to let you see a lot of cards in your deck. Yeah, so both players have strong hands, but Hugo does not have a mountain. So I think uh, if he draws one, it'll be interesting. Because he's because right now his Savage Knuckle Blade is sand, stranded in his knuckles. Right, and Savage Knuckle Blade, the reason to play Timor in standard, so you can bet it's pretty good <laughs> yeah. here in Seal Deck. But if he, even if he doesn't find it this turn, he's got stuff to do. He, uh, he has a Scion of Glaciers in his hand. He has a Soul Type Flare. So those are both great four drops. So, I mean, while the Knuckle Blade is obviously a lot more impressive, it's not like he's going to be doing nothing. Right. And we see Willie uh, plays a second Abomination face down. That's a guy I really like. I don't know whether it'll shine in this game or not, but the Soul Tide deck often can stalemate the game on the ground. And um, if you hit a couple times with that flyer and get to really improve your, uh, your card quality, turning excess lands into spells by, you know, discarding them in the late right. game, drawing extra cards, that, that's really one way to win a game with, you know, subtle commons right. without having to, you know, you know draw these uh, extremely rare cards or anything. Right. And I also let you, you fill your graveyard up with, again, those unwanted cards, which you can then delve for Hooting Mandrels, right. Saltai Scavengers, and, you know, ideally Necropolis Fiends and Treasure Cruises. Right. And look at that synergy with Treasure Cruise. You discard cards so you can cast it on the cheap. 
upkeep. Then you can discard the excess lands you draw off it to the abominations to um, draw even more spells. Obviously, you know, that's when things are running smooth, but, you know, we're just talking about if you're able to connect. Even if you're taking a couple points of damage, if you're really improving your card quality that much in the late game, you can probably win a game, even if you're taking four to six and hitting for three once or twice. So uh, great, great patience here from Adel, who's who had, uh, has had opportunities to unmorph a abomination, but instead continued to advance his board. Now with a scion of glaciers and a Highland game clogging things up, I think we'll see him take to the air here. Yeah, um, well, he has some options. Um, he does have dragon scale boon in his hand, so that kind of makes it interesting whether he wants to attack on the ground. If um, you go double blocked, it would be really bad for him. And uh, the sign, if he single blocks with the sign, it wouldn't be great for him. So obviously, like, he's not going to do that. He's just going to unmorph Abomination of Gadul. And, uh, yeah, he looted away an island. He played a six, tap, uh, a six land, a tap land. And yep. uh, everything's looking smooth for Wooly right yeah, now. Yeah, Thornward Falls is the play. Yeah. He says, I like, I like gaining a life instead of an island. I don't have anything to do with my island this turn. And uh, did you see what Yugo just drew? Is it a mountain? No, but it's a Ciroc. Oh, <laughs> So, he, so he's he's got some uh, some premium premium Tamir rares in his deck. Yeah, but no premium mountains to cast them with. <laughs> so uh, it looks like Willie's going to pull pretty far ahead, while Yugo, you know, can't really keep up in card quality without the mountain. And uh, no no willingness to trade his other abomination for a Highland game there. Which actually. I'm not saying he should have done, but I think this play is close, and he didn't even really consider it, which is interesting. I mean, you can get blown out. Like, let's say you make this block, and then he has a uh, Hugo has a Savage Punch and is able to kill your other Abomination. Sure. Then it's really bad for you. So that's really why you don't block. But if you knew that he had nothing in hand, you probably would block, because it's not really that exciting to get the second Abomination of Good Duel online, and he has Treasure Cruise in hand, so trades kind of favor him right, right now. But I think he didn't block correctly because you don't know that that first Abomination of Good Duel is just going to live and keep right. connecting. Let, let's talk a little bit about what's at stake here. Uh, the, these two teams are 1-1-0 one, one, and oh in their pools. 1-1-0. One, one, and oh. So they're 1-1. One, and one. Yes. So are they playing to advance? Well, Brazil, Bra this, is, this is win and in. This is winning in. So there's a little extra, you know, pressure. So like, you know, those decisions, do I, do I just block here? Do I not block here? Become a little, uh, a little more tricky. Well, I mean, the pressure, you know, can definitely cause people to make misplays sometimes. I, I understand that you're always supposed to make the correct play, but you definitely yeah. see people uh, struggle with that sometimes sure. under the pressure. Sure. It's, it's very common for people to struggle under pressure. I'm not claiming, you know, that if my life was on the line, I would be able to play my very, be my very best. I'm a human being. But in reality, strategically, you know, you do always want to make the best play. It doesn't matter if you're sitting around playing a fun game with your friend or if you're playing for top eight or to advance. Realistically, the best play is the best play. And in this case, um, it looks like they're the two and three seed, right? So this is just straight winner advances, loser doesn't? Correct. I guess that's not automatic. It depends on so, what the other so teams Will, are Will, Willie's attacking. Uh, Hugo wants to block, but uh, Willie wasn't sure if he was going to let him yet or not. I think he is going to allow it, and uh, he, he had the option to unmorph before blockers, but instead chose to dragon scale boon and take out the flare. Yeah, there's no reason for him to unmorph before blockers here because he's happier right. if Hugo blocks than if Hugo doesn't block. In fact, I'm not even 100% sure he would attack if he knew Hugo was never going to block. This is an appealing looking block, uh, so I think that's part of why he, he actually attacked there. So now he has to discard a card. He's drawn from the ability for Abomination and Godol. He's, he's thinking. So I think he was hoping to draw a uh, land here yeah. so that he could, you know, discard and then play land and treasure cruise or play land and morph or, you know, what have you. Since he didn't, he really has to decide yeah. what he wants to do with the rest of this turn. Yeah, he discards an Ice Feather even. I, I think that he, he will see a Savage Punch. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're going to see here. Right, so he's so right, so the the yeah, and that's a great turn for Willie. So he ate the two big creatures, all for six mana, and connected again with his abomination of Gadul. Those are the kind of turns that you know take a game that's close and really like put you far ahead in right. it. Because he now has ferocious on his morph, the abomination of Gadul gets plus two plus two from the savage punch because of the ferocious trigger. Yeah, I'd like to see. And he's able to take down the Scion of glaciers. I'd like to see you go drop a mountain here and pass the turn with the ability to cast a rock because I don't oh. think he's going to be able to win this game with a high land game. I 
I don't know exactly what he's thinking about. I guess Treasure Cruiser Morph. Um, I mean, if he morphs, he could then double block that morph. But if Willy can unmorph it, which he most likely can at this stage, any morph is really going to just eat both guys and, you know, end this game. If he Treasure Cruises, he can make his land drops, chump block the morph if he doesn't find anything, which doesn't seem great, but seems better than double blocking the morph. So, I mean, I would certainly treasure cruise here. And he'd have to pay two, it looks like? Uh, it looks like three, five cards in his yard. I'm not... Uh, I'm sorry, pay, pay two 100%. extra, I should say. Yeah. So, he instead chooses to play the morph. I mean... Uh, and there's the op an opulent palace. Yeah, don't get me wrong. He can chump block and cruise next turn for two mana. I'm just not really sure what that Snowhorn Rider is going to do in this game. I think I'd rather have invested my mana in the card drawing. I know normally you do want to add to the board before you draw cards, so it's you know kind of deviating from that rule. And but instead, he's actually just going to chump here. Well, I like this. Um, you can only get so low, and he gets a mana out of the high lane game. He's kind of turning it into a lotus petal by chumping. Sure. Because now he's only going to pay two for the cruise instead of three. If you, uh, if you do choose to morph the Snowhorn Rider there, and that's a close play by all means, you definitely are blocking with the Highland game here. That's, that's like half the reason to make this play, is that instead of paying three for your cruise there, you can maybe pay two for your cruise this turn and then still do something with the other four mana. Right. Me meanwhile, uh, Willie's got a, an Ancestral Recall online this turn. Is that good? <laughs> His historically, it's been okay. There you see him just remove seven cards. to pay for his treasure cruise. Remove seven, draw three. It looks like he's got another Abomination of Godola, but he plays a face-up Pine Walker. Yeah, well, we noticed that there, I noticed that there hadn't been uh, any Soul Tie yet, and uh, you noticed that he's got three Abomination of Gadules in hand, so maybe when you put those th two things together, we've solved the puzzle. <laughs> I mean, you have to have a lot of blue, black, green cards to play Soul Tie, I think, because I don't think blue Soul Tie has a, lot, a ton of synergy in Team Sealed. It's weird because, you know, it puts cards in the graveyard and then it has Delve, so that feels like synergy. But the thing is, each Delve card pulls from the other Delve cards. Yes. So it's not really the kind of deck that you just get more and more and more of, and you're like, yeah, I've got nine Delve cards and five ways to mill myself, you know? Then you just end up drawing hands with all Delve cards or all ways to mill yourself. I kind of personally think Delve is best done in small doses. Like, if you have one dead drop, one treasure cruise, a bit of revelations or two, and, you know, some removal, that's kind of, that's how you maximize Delve, in my opinion, in, in, uh, in Limited. Not by, you know, going all in with a million, you know, scout the borders and Delve cards. I mean, here you see the, the tension of having multiple Delve cards. Uh, Hugo's drawn a Hooting Mandrels, but he's not going to be able to play Hooting Mandrels and treasure cruise on the same turn. Right, and... Hugo does still have a pretty high life total, right? But he's way far behind on board, right? So and he's these, decided he's decided to play the Mandrels. These are close plays. I uh, I like this play. I don't know, you know, if he can win this game if he uh, double blocks that Pine Walker and Willie has a, rem a removal. But he's so far behind on board. I'm not sure that he could win a removal anyway. Right. So I think playing a round removal at this point is probably wrong. I think you just play that Hooting Mandrels. You now can double block the Pine Walker. You know, I'm not sure if Willie attacks with the morph what he's going to do. I mean, double blocking that morph is pretty scary. If it was a Wooly Loxodon or a Pine Walker, it would just eat both. Right. We know it's an abomination of Gadul, and, and the block is actually fantastic. Yep. <laughs> but Hugo doesn't know because we have X-ray vision and right. Hugo does not. Right. <laughs> and especially with two abomination of Gadul's already played this game, I doubt he's specifically going to put it on abomination of Gadul. Oh, no, only one's played, only the other one one's point. in his hand, sorry. But, yeah, uh, I don't know if he would find yeah, that We're just going to see Icy Blast here for the, for the time walk. Well, this should all but be game. Um, that's 5, 8, 12. That's 12, 12 yeah. yeah. 12, those creatures don't untap next turn. I don't really care what you have. Yeah, and that's the kind of play that if you're um, Hugo, you don't feel good or bad about your sequencing because you know you weren't going to beat Icy Blast no matter what you chose. Right. And then an even uh, a uh, just guy wind scout. And there's a pine walker for Hugo, but that's not going to be enough. No, you go down to four. Um, there's no real reason to show Willie anything at this point. I would just pick up my cards or pass the turn and then pick up my cards. <laughs> <laughs> just about the sequencing there. Right. 
I mean, some people, you know, might pass a turn in the hopes that Willie plays another spell, but yeah. I see no real reason for him to do that. He'd probably just turn his four guys. Yeah. There's not even anything for him to play around, really. You don't he have seven up to represent Thousand Eyes. He casts thousand Treasure wins. Cruise. So, uh, draws three. Yeah, I don't see. Uh, I don't see what's going on exactly. I don't even know why you'd want to show him a card like Treasure Cruise. It's not a big deal. But I don't think that there's anything conceivable for you go here. Right. I mean, honestly, until that point, Willie might not have even known he was Teamer. He, f he figures it out when he sees the uh, Snowhorn Rider. Right, and no matter when you concede, you still have to show your morphs. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you never know, you know, maybe there's a close decision for Willie on whether to bring in something like Disdainful Stroke and seeing, you know, a nice, slow, powerful card like Treasure Cruise that you know is going to sit in your opponent's hand could be the difference between him bringing it in. So I probably wouldn't cast it. All right, well, we'll see what happens in Game 2 after these brief messages. Outfit your Magic Collection with the newest Cons of Tarkir accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and portfolios of your favorite Magic artwork at UltraPro.com. Start on your road to the Pro Tour in Vancouver next July by playing in a preliminary Pro Tour qualifier. With more than 2,000 WPN locations running events, you're sure to find one near you. Visit magic.wizards.com slash pptq for schedules and information. All right, welcome back to coverage of the World Magic Cup. Here we are between Brazil and Portugal, and we are going to take a live look in on Gabriel Fair versus Bernardo Torres. Little and, Mardu mirror. Uh, oh, yeah, and we you see uh, Mardu Horde Chief and a Horde Ambusher on the Brazilian side of the table, while the Hate Blade, the Inoc Bondkin, and the Chief of the Edge are all in play for Portugal. Uh, Gab Gabriel's under uh, a little bit of a, an early rush from Bernardo. He's at 13. And Bernardo, just from a cursory glance at the deck list, seems to have the more impressive Mardu list. I'm seeing a Butcher of the Horde, an Ankle Shanker, uh, Mardu Rough Rider, Ponyback Brigade, and then all the staple commons. De debilitating Injury... Skull Hunter, Bonkin, Murderous Cut, a great uncommon, probably oh. the best uncommon here, here, co here comes a Butcher of the Horde. Yeah, Butcher, you know, just a dominant card in the Mardu deck in standard. 5-4 yep. um, Flying Haste, a little unfair in yeah. Seal deck. And you find out why the Hate Blade is so hateful. He's like, oh, I'm just going to get sacrificed again to the Butcher of the Horde. And Butcher of the Horde gets in with Haste. And he's, he's even got the double Russia battle. He's got the take-up arms. It, seem, it just seems like this is a, a much better Mardu deck. Yeah. Uh, Brazil now up one game at the other two tables. We just saw Willie Adel go up a game, and now Tiago Saparito is up a game on Andrade. Don't get me wrong, though. I mean, he burnt away, yeah, he burnt away the butcher, which just gave him a two for one because the hate blade stay in, stays in the yard. So I mean, this could end up getting close, and it was close whether he wanted to sack that hate blade to give it haste or not. I'm not sure that that's a play I would have made. My usual logic is that if the butcher stays around, I'm gonna win anyway. So uh, if I'm playing it on turn four, so I don't necessarily want to invest more in it. Even though, like, you would definitely sack the Hate Blade if you knew your opponent couldn't kill the Butcher, because the Hate Blade's not going to do more than five damage, and it's a race you're winning. It, you want to plan for the game where the Butcher gets answered, not the game where the Butcher doesn't get answered. Right. And so Feet of Resistance in hand for uh, Torres, and he's trying to decide, do I want to attack and try to get some value out of my feet of resistance, or do I want to fortify my board with a, a uh, Alabaster Kieran? And he goes with the Kieran. Hello. I mean, he could have, there's, there's very little that could go wrong if he attacks there. Yeah. He gets first strike and protection from a color off uh, on his uh, Chief of the Edge if he attacks. Yeah, attack was definitely reasonable, but perhaps he just oh. wants to save his cards and go to the air. And then the High shot. Sentinels of Ration. One of the big bomb cards in this format. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, he could have definitely gotten a potential huge blowout with that attack if both creatures got blocked, which is definitely likely. Um, no, not a huge blowout, but a good trade. Um, what did you want him to do? You want him to send just the chief? Could he could just attack with the chief of the edge. 
Yeah, and just uh, trade the feet for one of the guys. I don't think that's really great. It's not horrible, but you're basically just upgrading your chief and trading feet for a creature, which, you know, is positive value, but those creatures aren't that good. I'm guessing his reasoning was he would save feet to protect that alabaster kiln sure, in yes. the air. And I think we might see... We're going to see... Yes, we are. We're going to see a rush of battle. Well, things have changed now that the uh, high <laughs> sentinels have come, in, come into play. And he sends everybody in. And that feed is still going to be huge this turn as well. With the plus two, plus one, he's attacking with a 4-2 Bonkin, because I don't think that guy's a warrior. Um, the Chief of the Way is a 5-3. And the Alabaster Karen is a 4-4, four because four, that guy is also not a warrior. Right, the only, the only creature with lifelink is the uh, chief. So, not really great blocks here. And uh, Gabriel's already at nine, so he kind of has to block. I know he doesn't want to lose that high sentinels, so I'm guessing he'll do some blocking on the ground. He, he probably doesn't really want to double block the chief, because he would lose both guys even to nothing. So his only good block is the, on the Bonkin, but he can't take nine or he dies. So it looks like he'll probably have to put the Horde Ambusher and the Mardu Horde Chief in front of the Chief of the Edge and the Anik Bonkin. I mean, I can't imagine he, High Sentinels is going to trade with one of those. Maybe he has to. I don't know. You know, is his hand good? Have we seen Gabriel's hand here? I, I know he is holding a feat of resistance. Uh, I don't know what else is in his hand besides that. I guess it's pretty close. I mean, you really don't want to trade the High Sentinels, but it's better than dying, so he may, <laughs> he, may, he may have to make that play. I mean, if he blocks with the High Sentinels on the Chief, he can then throw the Horde Chief on the Bonkin. Uh, the other card he has is a Barrage of Boulder, so... So that's not too... Well, that, that means he's way less incentivized to kill the Bonkin, since he can kill the Bonkin with the Barrage. So I don't know exactly what we'll see from him here. I know he can't take two creatures and block with the Horde Ambusher, because the one from blocking, putting him to eight, would leave him dead then. So he could make the original play I suggested, which is just block both ground creatures, take one from the Horde Ambusher's drawback, and four from the Karen, which would put him to four life. Uh, or he could uh, make a double block. Or, or he could block with the High Sentinels on the Chief of the Edge, and then the Horde Chief on, like, the Bonkin, but he doesn't really want to trade with the Bonkin since Barrage is the one thing he has going, really. All right, well, we're going to switch back over to Table A. You can keep an eye on that for us, Ben. I'll, I'll uh, just tell me how that plays yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to get back to Willie Adele's match, but I do want to see this block. And he does make the original block I suggested, which is both ground creatures, which is what I like here, I think. Um, the reason being the High Sentinels can take over this game, and when your back is to the wall, you kind of need that power, and you need to take over the game quickly. If this game goes long, you can't really feel great about it. If it goes long without the High Sentinels in play. Meanwhile, here, uh, Hugo has gotten off to a much better start than he did in game one with a turn three Savage Knuckleblade, which is actually technically referred to as Savagest Knuckleblade. Yeah, and he, he found that premium mountain this time. And uh, <laughs> with, his, with his deck firing in all cylinders, let's see if Willie can respond. So Willie has a morph. Savage Knuckleblade, you know, kind of what I would consider a perfect standard card. Very balanced, very interesting. You know, I know Kibler says it's one of the best cards in the Timor deck, and, uh, you know, he's been playing that deck a lot. Turn three in Sealed deck, not so balanced. <laughs> there you look at Willie Adel as he tries to figure his way out. There you look at Hugo. He's like, eh, just keep up the pressure. And a Scion of Glaciers. So, so it looks like uh, on the on the table we were watching, uh, Torres kept his feet of resistance in his back pocket, yeah. so that maybe he can force through the last points of damage with that alabaster Kieran next turn. Yeah, it would have only saved the Bonkin. Uh, that was a close play, certainly whether to use it on the Bonkin or not. Like you said, he probably wants to use it to force through lethal if necessary. All right. So, no, no play from Willie Adel. Gabriel w was at nine, so he should be at four now. So this is pretty interesting. Um, it's not actually going to work out that great for him, I don't think. 
I'm still watching that other match just to see the conclusion because it looks so close and so interesting at the moment. Um, you know, the, ne the next turn now we have the high Sentinels blocking and him at four, but I don't think that, uh, he, that he can get the extra damage through with the Chief and the Karen. I guess he's going to play for the feet for the win yeah. uh, on the following turn, which will be the conclusion of this game. So, yeah, he's going to win if Gabriel bricks, and he's going to lose if he finds an answer here. And he bricks. Okay, let's get back to <laughs> Billy's match. So Bernardo Torres takes game one. So that's game for Adel, game for Tiago for Brazil, one game for Portugal in Bernardo's back pocket. So here you see... Dragon Eye Savants reveals a hand of Mountain, looks like Sagu Archer, Snowhorn Rider, and Dragon Scale Boon. So, what happened here? He did he double block he, the Knuckle Blade? He, or he double blocked Knuckle Blade and then unmorphed. The dragon, uh, the dragon scale. Uh, I mean, the dragon eye savant. Okay, and so I guess Hugo is uh, deciding whether to pump the knuckle blade to take out the dragon eye savant or play something from his hand. Okay, so what, while while there's two games actually, one for Adel and one for Tiago, that's actually two games for Bernardo, who uh, won qu uh, quickly in game one against Gabriel Fair. So Portugal has the first match win of this three-match set. Yeah, from looking at the deck list, I'm not that surprised by that. Uh, he, it looked like he had the way better Mardu deck. You see Tiago Saparito consulting with Willie Adel. Yeah, Tiago Saparito is a player uh, people at home might not be that familiar with. But Belovo on Magic Online, you know, he, he's a very experienced player, a, a, you know, a top player on there, you know, uh, tons of QPs, tons of Magic experience. And he, uh, you know, parlayed that into a Pro Tour Top 8 at, at Pro Tour Cons of Tarkir in Hawaii a few months ago. Definitely a guy I'm sure Willie trusts. So Scion of Glaciers gets pumped. Uh, so it looks like the... Morph, okay, the morph, the, the morph that was uh, put in front dies to the Savage Uncle Blade. No need to pump it. And another morph from Hugo. And then Saltite Charm takes down the Scion uh, at end of turn. So that didn't work out well at all for Willie. I know that he didn't have any great options. The Knuckle Blade is just hitting too hard too fast for Willie to really be able to do anything. I'm not sure what he was hoping for with that double block, though. Maybe that uh, Hugo would pass, and then he could pass and trade them both for it, for the Knuckle Blade. It just doesn't seem like there was a lot of promise there. I was watching the end of that Mardu game because it, it was just so close and awesome, and uh, I, d I did miss exactly what happened there, so I'm not 100% what Willie was trying to accomplish. Right, so... Get swing, Hugo swings in with the morph, swings in with the knuckle blade. We know the morph's a snowhorn rider. Dragon Eye Savants gets in the way of the morph. And Dragon Scale Boon. Okay, okay, th this, this explains a lot of it. So what he wanted to do was have that Dragon Eye Savant get on morphed, I guess, because now that he has an eight toughness creature, he can blank that Savage Knuckle Blade if uh, Hugo doesn't have anything. And when you're in a spot like this, you're not really trying to play around things because you can't really expect to beat a turn three knuckle blade and a, you know some some backup. The one thing that is kind of precarious here was that if if he had put the dragon eye savant first, Willie would not have been able to have it live, and then he may not have had an answer to the knuckle blade. So I think it kind of worked out a little bit to Willie's advantage, even though it's still a very bad situation for him. At but, the then, but this also forces Hugo's hand here, forces him to commit his mana into the Snowhorn Rider rather than lose it to the Dragon Eye Savant. Right. No, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not questioning this block. Of course, yeah. he, he blocked Boons there because now he has a 2 8 that can stop these big creatures and he can go on to play cards from his hand. I was trying to think through why Willie made that double block on the Knuckle Blade the previous turn. Sure. Because it didn't really have that much potential to work out good for Willie. And obviously, you know, with close plays, it's hard to say exactly which one's better, but Willie is a very experienced player with four Pro Tour top eights. So I, I, what I will say confidently is that he had a plan. Like, he has reasons why he made that double block. So I'm just trying to think a little bit and figure out what Willie's up to.
oh, okay. It just looked like he had two morphs but because the morph token was out. It was actually just the Savant. Ah. That makes a lot more sense because that I was trying to find reasons for that double block, and I really couldn't. So uh, that, that definitely makes a lot more sense. And, uh, you know, he just figured he wouldn't pump it because he'd have better stuff to do. And if he did pump it, it wasn't the end of the world. But I actually don't like that play if, if that was the case because um, he has the, if he had the Dragon Scale Boon in his hand, he knows that the Savant plus Boon can actually stop the Knuckle Blade indefinitely. So he ran a pretty big risk there if Hugo had just pumped the uh, the Knuckle Blade and took it out the Savant. He might have ended up with no real early game way to stop that Knuckle Blade and it would have kept connecting. So, I mean, depending on exactly what Willie had in his hand, he may have just drawn the boon, in which case that's a fine block. But if he already had the boon in his hand and he didn't really have any ways to stop the Knuckle Blade otherwise, I actually dislike that block a lot more now that that situation has been clarified for us. So no block on the Savage Knuckle Blade and... This could be pretty dangerous with a dragon scale boon in play in uh, hand for Hugo. Yeah, he's one mana short of actually dealing Willy Lethal. He can't actually do very much with that boon because the the uh, Dragon Eye Savant's a two eight and it's blocking a five five. So Snowhorn Rider can only get up to a seven seven, which won't be able to take out the Dragon Eye Savant. And then we see, but he does have a morph, which we know is going to be an Ice Feather Raven. That, on the other hand, is big trouble for Villy. Yes, it is. He chose to play the Ice Feather Raven instead of the sometimes unplayable Saigu Archer. Yeah, it's interesting. He could have played both, but then he does run the risk of running pretty, pretty hard into Death Frenzy yeah. or any removal. Um, not really Death Frenzy, because it would kill the Alpine Grizzly anyway, and that would be a game Willie would probably just be dead. But he does run the risk of losing the Ice Feather to a removal, and that's probably not a risk worth taking, because the bounce is so valuable here. Depending on what Willie leaves up, he's going to be able to, bl to bounce the Dragon Eye Savant in a turn, removing eight toughness worth of blocking, or he's going to be able to bounce it at instant speed and leave Willie just dead due to trample. Right. I imagine the situation that will occur is that he'll bounce it end of turn and Willie will just be dead because there'll be that giant trampler, there'll be the Knuckle Blade and the 2-2 two -two Flyer. Well, this is interesting. I, I wasn't expecting to see an attack out of Will here. No, I, I have to say I was not either. So this may be a, uh, this is going to be an icy blast. Yeah, that's the only he's thing gonna, that He's going to try sense. to time walk his way. But, let's... oh, and, and Hugo's going to be the first to act, which is, which is dangerous this, this here. This is going to be really interesting, though, because if he bounces the Alpine Grizzly, then Icy Blast won't keep them tapped for an additional turn. He would have to do it now, which would, you know, they just wouldn't untap this turn, and the next turn they would, instead of being able to do it on Yugo's turn. Now, the Dragon Eye Savant is a much uh, more convenient target to bounce because it loses the counters, but you know that Willie almost has to have Icy Blast the way that game played. Or maybe he was just representing it and didn't have it because no, he No, he was holding it. Okay. Did he... He did play it in game one, right? Yeah. So there's no real drawback to showing it there. So I'm not really sure why he conceded, but maybe he's just saving time. I mean, I can't really imagine a game Willie could have won there. Yeah. <laughs> Hard, hard to figure out how he comes back against the... Oh, I, well, I guess if even with the Icy Blast, uh, Hugo can bounce and replay. We could tap them inside combat yeah. at the beginning of combat. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that uh, Willie had no outs. So, I mean, that's what we were talking about earlier. Sometimes it's good to save time. You know, your teammates are helping you. We right. saw... A, a draw helps no helps nobody no usually, yeah. And we saw Separito over there helping Willie before. So, it takes a little extra time in team when you're consulting with your teammates and stuff like that. Right. So, you know, good for Willie for saving time, but uh, not good for Willie for having to concede because he was getting run over by a quick knuckle blade and Snowhorn Rider. Yeah, Tiago Separito, fresh off of his top eight at Pro Turconza Turkir. We're going to take a look in at him playing against Jao Andrade. And both players have made morphs on turn three. I'm kind of excited to see Thiago play a little because I have a lot of respect for those Magic Online guys who put in the hours. You know, I mean, if you're grinding all day, every day, getting that many QPs, playing dailies, you know, I, I figure you probably are pretty good at Magic. All right, the morphs trade. And we are going to see a Siege Rhino from Saparito. I'm afraid this is not going to tell you that much about his... <laughs> <laughs> like I just said, he's pretty good at magic. <laughs> We're not going to learn a ton here. Oh, but dra Dragon-style twins from the Portuguese player. That guy's interesting because some games he's good but not amazing. Yeah. But he's very threatening. He has the potential to do some very big things.
Marek Nightblade. For Saparito. So, Death Touch will be in play soon. Death Touch not at its best against Double Strike. <laughs> but that guy is a good card in general. I like him. So, it, lo it looks like Andrade has a handful of prowess things and no spells. I, I think he also has a Sage Eye Harry. Um, uh, Sage of the Inward Eye in hand. I think I saw a Force Away, but the problem is I don't think he has any islands out. I think he just drew his first oh. blue source in that Swiftwater Cliffs, and it came into play tapped. So this turn, I don't know what his options are. What did you see? I thought I saw a Sage of the Inward Eye. Yeah, I saw that too. And then there's a Force Away and a Jessica Wind Scout, I think. So he only has one card that I'm not really sure about, and it's a Mountain. So he has nothing he can do this turn. So I'm not sure why he was really thinking so hard this turn. You might as well just think on Willie's, uh, I mean, on uh, Thiago's turn here. Because obviously you're going to attack because it's six for two. And uh, if, if the Nightblade at uh, attacks back, the Nightwing. Yeah. And um, yeah, not, not a lot of options without an island there. Right of the Serpent clears the way. Rumble in for some damage. Seven to be exact. Andrade's down to eight. Yeah, that Merrick Nightblade is an excellent card. It's it's underperformed a little bit from what I thought at a, at first glance because you know Death Touch is really scary in, in limited, so you generally think um, it has a potential to be broken. It's a little slow, but it's really powerful. And once you activate it just once, it's a three four Death Touch, a very effective creature. And sometimes with Outlast, you end up with a lot of synergy. You know, like your other guys might have counters on it the turn you play it, turning them into Death Touch. And let me tell you, if you ever assemble First Strike plus Death Touch in limited. <laughs> That is very, very, very tough to beat. Well, you just watch someone when, when there's an ankle shrinker attacking. You know, there's, it's impossible to block. Debilitating injury on the Sage. So the Merrick Nightblade now has to decide whether it wants to attack or be outlasted. Probably just get into yeah, two. Yeah, just attack into the one-two. Yeah. There's not a lot that can go wrong. Feet of Resistance is pretty bad here for uh, Thiago if he doesn't have anything. I don't know if we've gotten a look at Thiago's hand. I mean, you could also block something and bounce your Sage if you really felt yeah. like. Yeah, that was definitely an option. This is a pretty aggressive attack. If, if he has Force Away, I'm... I'm I mean, if Thiago has a removal or something, by all means, if he had nothing, that's a pretty aggressive attack because Feet wasn't going to do all that much. I mean, it would just knock off the uh, debilitating injury and allow him to block the Siege Rhino and gain life, but it wouldn't have killed the Siege Rhino, whereas it would have ate the uh, Merrick Nightblade. Here's Just Guy Wind Scout. Depending on the way this game played earlier, though, Thiago might be able to assume Andrade doesn't have a Feet in his hand. He may have had some decent opportunities to use it. Looks like another Wooly Loxodon for Saparito. It's in, yeah, it's interesting when you get decisions like that because if that wasn't an Outlast card, I would definitely always attack there. I'm not going to just put a feed in my opponent's hand that I have no reason to put there. Since he had the option to either feed, I mean, to either attack with it or Outlast it, and attacking with it is a little bit better, but not a lot better, I'm, I probably would have uh, Outlasted there. Definitely an interesting decision. So attacks with just the Siege Rhino. He's able to put together his first strike uh, death touch death combo, touch combo net this, this turn. Yeah, those guys are going to be scary next turn. And Andrade still has to deal with the Siege Rhino now, which I'm not sure that he can. He has a force away, but that doesn't really help <laughs> That's you. almost counterproductive. Yeah. <laughs> force away is not at its best against Siege Rhino. And he's one point short, I think. If he were to double block it and force away one of Thiago's other creatures, he would be up to four power, which is one point short of Cedrano's toughness. And uh, close doesn't really count in magic. But Andrade's at two, so he has to do something. I'm not sure what he's even doing. Isn't he just dead to tramp? Oh, lifelink. Okay. Yeah. All right. But this is still horrible for him. Um, you know, he's... Gaining like one life, because he's taking two trample and gaining three. And his wind scout is dying, and the force away is gone. I, I almost, can you, can you bounce the sage there? Is that better? Yeah, I mean. But then you have, then you have like, yeah, two first strike 
death touch guys yeah that's next tough turn. To beat. let's see if he has a, an end hostilities in his list because that's one of the only ways i could really imagine andrade getting back into this game um i mean he's it really like, it looks like he just drew a set of drift so that's pretty not... sure he is just dead here set of drift yep, is not he... quite end hostilities it's close yep and so Tiago Saparito takes that game and he takes it, which means he evens up the match score between these two teams. That's one match for Brazil and one match for Portugal. Uh, and our Willie Adel versus Hugo game three is going to be the decider. So uh, we are going to see national champion Willie Adel versus Hugo Alexandre Fernandez Dines to determine which of these teams will advance to the next round of pool play. So Hugo with his almost constructed team or death, <laughs> Savage Knuckleblade and Ciroc. Willie with a very nice looking Soul Tide deck, but looking more like a seal deck and less like a standard deck. So Willie's on six cards this game. He, he did have a mulligan. They both went to six, it turns out. I'm taking a look at Willie's deck list here. I don't think he would be, I don't think LSV would be too happy with Willie. Willie has three treasure cruises, but he only elected to play one of them. <laughs> well, what's the correct number of treasure cruises to play with, according to Ben Stark? According to Ben Stark, probably one, maybe two, depending on how much other late game you have, if he has a dead drop or something like that. According to LSV, Three, and if you can get more, more. <laughs> Three and a cranial archive. Yes. <laughs> so Morph gets in. No, uh, the third land came into play tapped for Hugo, so he's going to be a little bit under the gun here. Yeah. Willie doesn't have a ton of expensive spells in this deck, and he does have the uh, three Abomination of Gadules, which are particularly good with Treasure Cruise. I actually think he could have probably played two. I think that would have been my number. Take, take a look at the hand that Dinez has to work with. It is chock full of spells and not chock full of land. He plays a morphed woolly locks it on. This is unfortunate for him to have uh, mana problems like this in two of the three games. I didn't want to see him run Willy over with a turn three knuckle blade, turn five Sirak or anything, but I did want to see him have a forest island and mountains so that he could play, you know, all his spells and play a nice game. He still has a shot. I mean, he's, he's not facing that scary of creatures if he draws the forest this turn. Right. Will, Willie chooses to unmorph his Abomination of Gadul, leave his uh, other morph back. And he drew the forest. I think his other morph is a Mistfire Weaver. Okay. I think he could have probably attacked there. Uh, it's unlikely that Hugo would have blocked. With five open, you can pretty much rep anything. I know people aren't that big on bluffing, but, you know, usually just point them both in the red zone. So salt type flare comes down. So this should be a really tight game now. Yeah, and uh, Dragon Scale Boon is the freshly drawn card for Willie, which really lets him bash both his guys in here. Yeah, and... Hugo has a nice stacked hand, kind of what I wanted to see. He has his forest, but he doesn't have something like a turn three knuckle blade that's really tough to answer. So he's going to have to navigate this game now. A little bit behind, but not too far. Wow. Oh, he drew Dragon Skill Boon. But yes. I was like, wow, is he really going to bluff now after not attacking <laughs> last turn? <laughs> that, that would, with the same mana, that would be an interesting uh, play. But yes, with the Dragon Skill Boon. It's a more convincing bluff if you do it the second time. He's like, well, he clearly didn't have anything last turn. Wow. Yeah, and uh, Hugo did not pick up on that Dragon Skill Boon. And really, he should have been able to because, you know, Willie didn't attack last turn. And then you say, what changed this turn? Right. He didn't even play another land, so it's not like it's a Wooly Locks it on and now it's online. So if he's attacking with it this turn, he has to have something like Dragon Scale Boon. And he does. And the Morph eats the Salt Type Flayer. So that's a, that's a pretty bad block by Yugo. And he didn't have to block. You know, he really should try and uh, play around Dragon Scale Boon. It's not the kind of card that's just unbeatable from these types of board states. You can make a lot of nice double blocks against it since it's just plus two plus two. I know sometimes when you're back to the wall, you're inclined to say, let me just make this block and make him have it. But I don't. I think in this spot, he probably should have tried to play around it. Right, and I think we may see uh, 
we may see a double block here. He's also pretty low and hasn't taken that much damage. Uh, did he gain the four life from the Soul Tide Flare? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure he does. I'm not sure if he's if he did and he is correctly at nine, if he is actually at 13, or if he just missed it. It is a trigger. You are allowed to miss it. I'm not saying he did. Right. Just doesn't feel like he could already be down, have taken 15 damage. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Bad handwriting. <laughs> okay. So the correct life total is 18, which uh, does make sense. That that's about where I would have thought he would be. Okay. Oh, it's set adrift when you when you're when you're constrained on lands and you're really you know struggling to find enough mana to deploy your hand. That card can be pretty backbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. And it is here. Yeah. No. No. Leaves him no box. And uh, Willie Adel continues to sculpt his hand with that Abomination of Control, making that card look really good. That card is really good. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, I know, but it's, it's you know, when people do their pick orders of the common clan morphs, it usually finishes last for people. I think that might be more a reflection on Soul Tie than a reflection sure. on Abomination of Gadul. And also, that whole cycle is really strong. Yes, I agree. Snowhorn Rider, a.k.a. the Brutal Morph. Snowhorn Rider, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, being the worst in that cycle is like being, you know, the worst player on an NBA team or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not exactly anything to be ashamed of. So I, I believe that Morph, yeah, that Morph is a Mistfire Weaver. So I think they're talking about whether or not they want to maybe just unmorph it and... Uh, fly over yeah, rather than subject themselves to a double block here. Yeah, I know Hugo didn't pick up on the Dragon Scale Boon, but he should know that that morph cannot do anything good with five mana. He doesn't know that it's a Misfire Weaver. It could be a Wooly Loxodon right. or something like that. But he, if it was, you know, a Krumar Bonkin or a Pine Walker or something, it would have attacked that one, that one turn that it didn't. So I think that uh, this is a good play by, by Willy to just uh, unmorph it and, you know, hit with both big flyers. Right. So he gets in for eight, drops Hugo to three, chooses not to use the ability of Abomination of Gadul there. I guess either just worried about time or happy with his hand. I mean, he, he probably just missed it, but he's probably not thinking about it at this point because I don't even know if, if uh, Hugo has any outs here. I mean, right. he has to deal with right. both big flyers. I mean, look at, look at his hand. He's pretty happy. He's got Force yeah. Away. He's got Salt Eye Charm, and he's got a Treasure Cruise. He's yeah. like, I don't need to improve this. I've got three perfect cards. Yeah, and not that you ever want to make a mistake. It was correct for him to have used it there. He's nowhere near decking, and it puts another card in the graveyard. Let's Treasure Cruise be cast cheaper. It was definitely correct to use it, but it was a very complicated decision whether he cast spells that turn or on morph Misfire Weaver, which I think he chose correctly to on on tap the uh, to on morph the Misfire Weaver and get him. And both there's the, the handshake. Team Brazil goes to two and one. They advance past Portugal. Uh, I mean, kudos to these three young players with with not a lot of experience making it into day two, earning themselves a little bit of money mm -hmm. for their young Magic careers. But Team Brazil is the one that is going to advance to the round of 16 here in pool play. Willie Adel and the Brazilian team. Yeah, let's not forget Thiago here. I mean, like I said, maybe with more online success than in-person success at this point, but he just top aided the Pro Tour. Yeah. And he's a big name online. So yeah. this is really a team with two, like, pro-level players, two yeah. very good players. Absolutely. And Thiago is someone that Willie Adel has taken under his wing and uh, is really you know, hopes to be the future of Brazilian magic. You know, pa Paulo now in the Hall of Fame, you know, get it, getting a little older, maybe thinking about the next phase of his life at some point. Willie has certainly got an eye towards, you know, he's like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a young guy. I don't know if I can do this forever. He's like, I want to make sure there's another wave of Brazilians on the Pro Tour. And, and that's something that's been a big passion for him in his career. And, and Tiago is someone he has his eye on as, as one of those players. Yeah, a lot of times I feel like, you know, sometimes stories, like, uh, get a little played up. But in the case of Willie and the uh, Brazilian magic scene, I don't think it has. I think he's just been, you know, a pillar of that community, you know, uh, running a store, running programs to help get the Brazilians to the pro tours, just doing it basically, you know, everything he could to grow that scene. Yeah, and, uh, you know, punishing a uh, kind of a clumsy draw from Hugo. How, how uh, what do you do when you see your opponent struggling for mana is there is there a secret to it? You, you know what 
Tell me about it while we're on lunch. We're going to send it back to the news desk right now, and you'll tell me how to play when my opponent's stuck on three or four lands. I'm not telling you anything. <sighs> All right, thanks so much to Brian David Marshall uh, and Ben Stark, the Hall of Famer there, giving it to you straight uh, through the three rounds of Khans of Tarkir uh, team sealed. That's the end of Limited. It's also the end for 16 teams, 16 more advance. Let's get to the board. We're not quite done with the round. Let's get to the board and let's show you Pool A. Malaysia, Hong Kong, Thailand and Greece. The second result has come in. Hong Kong are through at two and one, and they have been joined by Socrates, Rosa Chaos, and the Greek team. Bill Chronolopoulos is through. Congratulations to both of them. Thailand, who were one of the pace setters early, Lars Dam and the team are out, and the Malaysian team, the overall number one seed coming into the day, 6-0-1. They didn't lose a match yesterday. They have lost twice here in the morning. Their pools were not great and they are gone. So Hong Kong and Greece advance from Pool A. Let's move to Pool B then. Now this one, we already knew that South Korea were gonna be in. They have in fact swept the table. They go to three and oh by beating Scotland who fall to one and two. The Slovak Republic at that point knew they were in regardless of the outcome, because even if they had fallen to one and two and Guatemala had risen to one and two by virtue of being number one seed, the Slovak Republic would have been in. But as it is, they win, they defeat Guatemala. Again, hats off Guatemala for making it today too, but the top two seeds advance. The question is whether that 3-0 for South Korea will allow them to leapfrog the Slovak Republic when it comes to reseeding. You add together all your day one results and the three this morning. We will reveal the pods later in our lunch break before we get to the top 16. So that's uh, Pool B, let's look at Pool C. Now this was already relatively straightforward in that the Netherlands knew with their two wins because they were the number one seed, they were guaranteed to be in. They played Venezuela and actually they decided to take a draw um, because the point with the one win for Venezuela, the extra point might put them further up the standings, chance to earn some more money in what is a very big prize pool. That left the Russian Federation to defeat Spain. A big surprise to see Spain at 0-3. Thought they had a terrific chance of advancing all the way to the top eight. They have not. And Dmitry Budakov and uh, Zoya Bolova and the team, they emerge and march onwards with the Netherlands. Once again, the top two seeds advancing in Pool C. Let's take you to Pool D. And we already knew that Israel were going to be in. And now, of course, uh, you're going to wait for that uh, Brazil-Portugal result to come in and go grey. But we've just seen it on air. We know that Portugal are gone and Brazil are through at 2-1 and one to join Israel. And Shahar Shenha, with that 3-0 record there, was already a number one seed. You can guarantee Israel will be a number one seed again in A, B, C or D pool coming up after lunch. So Brazil and Israel through in Pool D. Let's go to E then and see what we've got here. So this was Sweden, England, Hungary and Norway. And the way this worked, England were up against Hungary in the last round. The Hungarians won to advance to two and one. And as you can see, the Sweden-Norway match, a little local encounter, to put it mildly, Hall of Famer Olorada for Sweden, Hall of Famer as well for Norway there. But, Nico Herzog, even if Norway win that one to go to two and one, they will be the bottom of the three two and ones. The fourth seed comes back to bite Norway, and that means England, the two seed, Hungary, the three seed, are through. And remember, Hungary and England both started out this weekend 0 and 2 in this format in Kansa Tarkir team sealed. So great job by both of them. Let's move to pool F. This was Argentina, Mexico, Denmark and Colombia. And what we have here, we're still waiting for the result of Mexico and Denmark, but because Argentina and Colombia, they were both at 0 and 2, they got paired against each other, they decided to play for fun, they took a draw to see whether that point each might bump them up the standings a little bit. Mexico and Denmark are playing for seed going into the top 16, but they are both there. Marcelino Freeman, the captain of the Mexicans, Martin Muller for Denmark, the young 17-year-old, might be 18 by now, Thomas Enervoldsen on that team, Simon Nielsen as well. Mexico, Denmark advance from Pool F, Argentina and Colombia out the door. So on we go, let's have a look at Pool G. 
So here is G, and there you see Uruguay sweep the pod, the group of death. They took out the Dominican Republic, they took out the United States, they took out Chinese Taipei. That's a phenomenal achievement by Uruguay. Great job by them, but they are joined by the United States. Uruguay beat the United States in the decider. They were both already through, but as a 2-1 from that fourth seed, USA might get up to a third seed. I doubt they're gonna be a second seed, and that means they may well need 3-0 to get through to the top eight. But here they were, they were a bottom seed here, they got through at 2-1. and one. Uruguay, USA, both through. Great job by both of them. That brings us to Pool H, let's take a look. And finally we have Serbia at 2-0-1, oh, Slovenia at 1-1-1. One, one, and one. This was a real crawl over the line in this group, my word. South Africa at 1-2. and two. The Czech Republic needed to beat South Africa. They got that, they got to 1-2, and two. but it was what we thought might happen. Serbia and Slovenia, next door neighbors, were they gonna end up playing it out? The draw was good for Serbia. They were already through. Another point might leap them above. Already a top seed, you see, from this first pool. So that extra point probably puts them in the number one seed in the top 16. So Slovenia, in an incredibly unlikely combination of 1-1-1 one, one, and one as a bottom seed, advanced to the top 16 with Serbia. Slovenia, Robin Dola and the guys, congratulations to them. 1-1-1 one, one, one probably won't cut it in the top 16, but we will see. So that's where we are. Almost done. We're going to go away, work out all the maths for you, and then we will reveal the top 16 pods, how it's going to work out, where the 16 teams line up in A, B, C and D in scorecard order. Seeding, quite important it turns out. But here's something a little bit simpler. Tomorrow, four players, not even countries this time, four players will come back to battle for the World Championship title. Two of them will be from Japan, Yu Yu Watanabe and Kentaro Yanomoto. One of them is a recent Pro Tour champion, Mr. Patrick Chapin, the innovator from the United States. And one of them chasing the dream of both titles in one year, in one day, Surely he can't do it. The reigning world champion, Shahar Shenhar. When the world championship went dark on Wednesday night, we settled in with the four semi-finalists for the world championship to find out their thoughts as they prepared for the biggest day of their magic lives. We'll see you very shortly. Hi there, Marshall Sutcliffe here, and I have Kentaro Yamamoto with me. He is in the top four of the World Championship. Congratulations. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I have some questions for you, of course. Uh, first, how do you feel about your competitors? You've got three very strong competitors to play against in the top four. ロッツアーチャンピオン。シャハラシャハーはワールドチャンピオン。うん。渡辺優也もワールドチャンピオン。僕だけあのタイトルを持ってないので、僕は挑戦者として頑張りたいです。I got the beginning. Patrick, yeah, Chaping, <laughs> he's a pro tour champion. And uh, Shahar is a world champion. Yuya Watanabe, of course, is a world champion. I am no champion. <laughs> so I'm a, uh, I'll be a challenger, and I'm going to be challenging against them. Not a champion. <laughs> Not yet. Mada <laughs> champion, <laughs> don't So in the round before the last round, you got to sit down against your countryman, Yuya Watanabe, Yes. Shake hands and put yourself into the top four. What a special moment. How did it feel? Mm. Uh, he's, uh, Yuya is a very good friend, and uh, he uh, practiced with them for this particular event also, mm -hmm. so he was relieved, too. He was also <laughs> relieved. Both relieved. Um, you have a few days off here, uh, three days, and then you have to come back on Sunday. What are your plans for the next few days until the top four? 
何をして過ごしますかマジックオンラインで調整します。なんか、テスティマジックオンライン。はい。What does your next few days look like? We, there's a day off tomorrow. Yeah, well, you that day off is not do. a day off for me. <laughs> it's、um, not, is it? Yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to be waking up at 9, well, not waking up. I'm going to be waking up at 4 a.m., but I'm going to be meeting at,、uh, the Israeli team here at 9 a.m.、Uh, we're just going to be testing. Probably going to do like two to three, maybe, maybe even four team seals, and then we're going to figure out our standard, unify.、Um, yeah, and then that's, I guess, just tomorrow, and then the next, I'm just doing the tournament. And then you're going、yeah. to play the World Magic Cup for、yep. the next two days, and then you're set to play in the top four on、right. that Sunday. And then who knows? Maybe you could run it with,、uh, with Team Israel like as well. It was the same thing there. Right. Now, talk、Probably、to us a little bit、magic. about, though, what it would mean to you to be the first two time world champion. You know, we've never had one in Magic. What it would mean to me? It would mean to me the same thing as it is to be the, the first you know, world champion of Israel. It's, it's, it's not really a difference. I mean, it was just doing it. Again, like, no big deal, just do it, it again. It's not what I mean, but <laughs> it's just, it, it just the first time was so amazing that the、yeah. second time is not going to be able to top it. It's just going to equal it, you know? Sure.、Yeah. But still, it has to mean the world to you to do it. Yes, it, it certainly does. Yeah. And, and, and right now, it's interesting because you've actually accomplished so much, even just in this tournament.、Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, pro points racked up a bunch of those already. Yeah, I got nine pro points. Nine pro points. That's more than winning a GP. It is. <laughs> it's not too bad for a few years. It didn't used、work. to be, but it is. Now. It is now, yeah. And then moving forward, you're, you're, you're going to lock up a bunch of money here as well. And、uh, it looks like you know, you're know, o y u going to have to try to stay focused. Are you worried over the next couple of days that a lot of your focus is going to be taken by the World Magic Cup? Or are you really just going to turn your attention to that and just forget about the, the World Championship for now? I'm not really sure what I'm going to do when it comes to testing against Yuya's match and、uh, Yamamoto and Chapin's.、Um, I haven't really figured it out yet because I do have to. Do a lot, a lot for my team. And so I think I might do,、uh, I'm, I'm really going to focus on the World、uh, Magic Cup. But then after the tournament, I might spend like five or six hours each day. Maybe not five or six, that's probably too much. Like four hours each day just grinding that, uh, uh, the UEA matchup. And、uh, hopefully I'll feel more comfortable. And、All、if、right. I don't make day two, then I'll definitely be just playing. Just playing for practice. Yeah, just playing. All right. Well, I'm Marshall Sutcliffe wishing Shahar Shenhar all the best in the top four. The World Championship. Hi there, Marshall Sutcliffe here, and I've got Yuya Watanabe with me. And for translation pers- purposes, Kyoko, thank you for,、uh, for joining us. First, congratulations. You are in the top four of the World Championship again. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, so first question.、Uh, what was I going to ask first?、Uh, the other, uh, we already have、players. these questions. So, yeah. so you're playing against three of the best players in the world. Talk to us a little bit about what it feels like to play against those type of players. So, this is a very special player. いやーっていうのは、えー、毎回プロツアーなどで戦ってて思います、まあ、チャピンとかはあの全チャピンが優勝したプロツアーで2回負けているので、まあ、今回できればレジメイミチを外したいなと思いますし
まあ、シャハーラは僕と一緒で、えー、っとワールドチャンピオンの肩書きを持っているんで、まあ、今回シャハーラと準決勝に当たるので、まあ、シャハーラとはどっちが本当に強いワールドチャンピオンなのかっていうのを決めたいと思います。Okay. Um, in general, you know, he played、uh, against them in many pro tours, so they know how great they are. Oh, yes. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> And uh, uh, about、uh, Chapin,、uh, at the pro tour that he won, was it in 15? Mm. Was it a journey? A、uh, journey in the next. Journey, okay. Yeah. He uh, lost twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>、okay. Against him, so it's not the, the player that he won to play against.、Oh. Um, and、uh, yeah, so he's the one that 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 he's the one Down and have a draw into top four with somebody else from your own home country. Yamamoto san to Hikibake de, Sakin, Boy, I can't must take it all. Nihon no sen should be, my Yamamoto san to Ishoni, and Saki ni top four Kibeta to you, Toki no Kimochi or Sitakasa. Hijoni and Sishimasta. So relieved. Relieved. Yamamoto to Afran Kara, my Ishoni Magic, and Pro Magic Ishoni still Naka de, and a Koyubutai de. でえー、合意の上の引き分けで、えー、お互いのトップを決めれたのは非常に光栄なことですね。I was very happy because、uh, uh, Kentaro is a very good friend of mine and we practiced、uh, a lot together and it's just relieved that you know, we were able to、uh, confirm top four before other players. Okay, now the next few days for you,、uh, are you going to get some rest? Probably not because you've got to play in the World Magic Cup. 次の明日明後日なんですけど世界選手権の日曜日の前なんですがどのように過ごしますか休みなんかないですよマジでもうね No way I have to go through this <笑> Too much magic? あすいませんマジで明日から明日はチームメンバーで集まってチームのデッキの最終調整をして明後日えっと残りの2日間はえっとワールド<笑>マジックカップの初日と2日目をやって、まあ、そこでトップ8を目指す戦いをして、まあ、できればトップ8に入って。日曜日両方に参加できるように頑張りたいと思います。Yeah. He is going to meet up with his teammate tomorrow. Tomorrow. They have to go through the, the gameplay and their strategy again. And、uh, their goal is to, to become top eight. Of course. To play the championship game on Saturday for both events. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so, one last question for you. You have a chance to be the first two time world champion for Magic coming this Sunday. How much would it mean to you to get that? So, this is the first time I've ever been to the first time I've ever been to the first time I've ever been to the first time. Yep. I'm going to do my best. I've done it before. <laughs> so I'd like to do it again. And、uh, yeah,、uh, he missed it last year. So this time around, maybe. Okay. Well, thank you for your time.、Uh, I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, wishing Yu Yu Watanabe all the best in the top four of the World Championship. Hi, everybody. Brian David Marshall, sitting here with Pro Tour Hall of Famer Patrick Chapin. Patrick. Two thirds of the way there. Pro Tour journey into next, it's a very long third. <laughs> the Swiss rounds of the World Championship is the second third. And now, two matches to go to achieve your stated goal of becoming the World Champion. How are we feeling?、Um, I guess、uh, pleased so far, but mostly just focused on the,、uh, the next two matches.、Um, it's going to be nice to get a few days of rest. And、uh, do a little preparation for,、uh, for those matches, but there's plenty of time to think about anything else after those two matches. Now, you, you have a lot of experience playing against the competitors in this top four through the Swiss rounds. You, you actually played against most of the top of the standings here、uh, repeatedly as you kind of sat on top and people churned through trying to knock you off the、uh, top of the hill. Yeah, I actually played against the rest of the top four, the other three guys in the top four,、uh, seven times. Wow. So half of my matches. And.、Uh, <laughs> And then the,、uh, the next four people in the standings、um, played against all of them also. And、uh, 
uh, played against a lot of really great competitors this weekend, and uh, from the looks of it, almost all of them are at the top of the standings. <laughs> so you're, you're headed you're head towards the showdown with Kentaro Yamamoto. How, how, how did those matches play out for you during the Swiss rounds? Um, I, one of the games, he was uh, a little light on mana and uh, actually conceded before showing me what he was really playing. And he made it look like he was playing a very different strategy. He made it look like he was playing a blue-black control deck. And this was the first round where we didn't have deck lists. So I sideboarded as though he was a blue-black control deck. Oh. And it turned out that he was a uh, Sidisi whip deck. But uh, fortunately, my plan against blue-black control uh, involves boarding in all the unoffenses. <laughs> That worked out. What that worked out well for you then. Uh, so, what, what what's your plan as far as uh, play testing? Do you do you, uh, you know you, you know the matchups pretty well? You've seen these decks. It's a small field. Uh, as we said, you've played all these guys. So, you know, do, is it is it more of getting yourself into a mental state, or is there actually a lot of uh, you know research you can do into the matchup? Uh, I mean, there's going to be some some play testing against their exact version, just becoming familiar with them. Uh, particularly uh, Yuya's deck, which is a slightly different uh, build of Jeskai than uh, than I have a lot of experience against. But um, mostly the next few days going to be trying to uh, get some rest, get unjet lagged, uh, maybe walk around Nice a little bit, and uh, enjoy ma watching the Magic World Cup. Yeah. And uh, as far as preparation, I got, or testing, I guess, testing with uh, Paul Rietzel and uh, possibly the uh, Pantheon guys like uh, Huey, Owen, and Reed. Okay. Well, good luck this weekend, and uh, congratulations on uh, two-thirds of the journey. Thanks. So those are the four players in the World Championship. We are still halfway to finding out which eight national teams will be joining them. But I've been joined by Brian David Marshall, who had, I take it, quite a fun uh, morning in the booth. Yeah, it was fun. We were working with Ben, watching some great players play Team Sealed. Um, you know, just very, very interesting format, you know, that straddles somewhere between, you know, limited and block constructed. It exists somewhere in between where you just have these decks that regularly have three and even four of the most powerful commons, sometimes multiple uncommons, and, you know, a really good chance that some of the most powerful rares are going to show up. So it's it's kind of this weird hybrid format. Yeah, it feels incredibly powerful. You yes, can, It's absolutely. one of the reasons it's so much fun yeah. is that you get to do the things that really you can, in regular sealed, you sort of dismiss as, well, I put two mythics together and watch what happened. Or, even the, or even the things that just won't ever really happen in a draft because, you know, you can't reliably get four Savage Punches. Where we saw multiple decks with four Savage Punches. Yeah. So, you know, this red-green archetype that almost never shows up in draft is something that we saw in multiple decks pull off in the Team Sealed rounds. Yeah, epic stuff. We have all the results, we have all the math done behind the scenes, which means it's time to reveal where these 16 seeds will play out their three remaining matches here on day four of Worlds and day two of the World Magic Cup. So let's get to it and we begin with Pool D. So this will feature your number four seed, who is the Netherlands. They are the top seed in Pool D. They are joined by the number five overall, who is Serbia. So two Europeans will clash. The third seed in Pool D is Hungary, the number 12. And that, by our calculations, mean we should see the number 13 seed, who is Denmark. So Netherlands, Serbia, Hungary, and Denmark will play out Pool D with the Netherlands and Serbia, knowing that two and one will get them in to the top eight tomorrow. Brian David Marshall, talk us through Pool C. So Pool C starts out with, at the top of the pool, Mexico in third, as the third seed. Uh, the second seed in the pod, in the pool, is the Slovak Republic as the sixth seed. And then uh, we revisit the Cold War at the bottom of the pod with uh, the Russian Federation, in a, as the 11 seed and the United States as the 14 seed, wow. who will both be fighting to go 3-0 to guarantee getting through into the top eight. So just checking, the United States have to play Mexico 
and the Russian Federation, and then even Flock and Matei Zatelkai. Correct. Okay, super. As a fourth <laughs> seed. As a fourth seed. They, they know that, you know, going in, that they they're, they know they just have to win all three of their matches here. Okay. Although, two and one, it's two possible. One, it is That's possible. That's how they made it into here. Let's go to Pool B and see how the seeding plays itself out. Your number two seed overall is Israel. Shahar Shenhar keeping the dream alive. Two and one will be enough for them. They're joined by... South Korea, the number seven seed. So they too only need two and one to guarantee a place on Super Sunday. The third seed in this pool is Hong Kong. So Li Shi Chan, Meng Qi Zheng, they will come in as the third seed and that leaves Greece, they made it into the top 16. Great job. They were in in 32nd place yesterday. They've upped their game to 15th <laughs> here. Can they clamber now? Seven more places to be the eighth seed, for example, going into Just day three. Around. That's all they have to do, for sure, against Hong Kong, South Korea, and Israel. I think Greece will think they've got every chance of qualifying from that pool. But we have one pool remaining, Brian David Marshall. It's Pool A. Who is the top seed? So I, I don't think this was a team that a lot of people had on their radar coming in, but Uruguay is the top seed. They are just going to need to go 2-1 and one to advance to the top eight. You've got to be very proud here, Rich. Mm -hmm. In the second seed in this pod, England. They started out 0-2 and have uh, battled their way back. They just need two more wins to go into the top eight. And then Brazil in the third seed. And finally, we have Slovenia in 16th place, advancing to the next round of pool play, needing, well, as we've said a couple times, a 3-0 to guarantee getting through into the top eight. All right, now we're going to stay with pool A because we've been number crunching, but we've also been deck crunching. And we, of course, know that from here on in, these three rounds will be fought out over team unified standard. BDM, before we get into what each team is playing, Quick refresher course for those who couldn't be with us yesterday. What is this team unified standard thing? Very easy to describe. 75 cards here, 75 cards here, 75 cards here, A, B, and C. Take them, put them on top of each other. As long as it's still a legal standard deck, you're good. You can't play a fifth copy of Tranquil Cove. You can't play six copies of Sark and Dragon Speaker. You can only play four. Can I stop looking now at the deck here and, oh, sorry. No, I'm not done shuffling. Okay, fine. 225 cards, one deck, must be standard legal. So that was the puzzle that everyone came in yesterday. Let's see what the teams in Pool A came up with and see if there are any clues as to how the afternoon might go for them. So why don't we take a look in Pool A at Uruguay. You see the number one seed there. They are the top seed joined by England, Brazil and Slovenia. And here are the three players who will play for Uruguay. Sebastian Martinez will be on Mardu mid-range. Federico Rivero on Soldier Agro. Huh. I'm assuming that's uh, more of a weight weenie deck. Right. And then Martin Castillo will be Abzan aggro. So, so a, lot, a lot of teams had a control player. Their control player is just more to mid-range. Right. <laughs> Uh, and that's something uh, I'll be interested to see when we get to the Netherlands, because I believe that they follow this very similar idea of let's try and narrow our color options down, let's not get too fancy, let's not go super clan-wise, let's be just nice, neat package, aggro, aggro, aggro. Uh, but we'll see uh, how that pans out. That's Uruguay. Why don't we take a look at the number two seed in this pool? It is England. And uh, congratulations, must say, to Fabrizio, Francesco, Ricardo, and Dave, uh, who are the England <laughs> team. Uh, well done to them. And you see that their three decks, they are going the control route. Blue, black control for Fabrizio. It's very funny, right? So in the first, in, in Uruguay, we saw Mardu mid-range at sort of the slow end of their clock. Mm -hmm. Here, it's here it's their aggro deck right. with, with two control decks, mm. you know, uh, Abzan Whip and the classic blue, black control you know, being the, the more controlling slower decks. Yeah, and it's very interesting that Fabrizio and Terry, who has all four of the GP top eights associated right. with Team England, he's on the blue-black control deck, which on the one hand means he will not be helping his teammates during key matches. An interesting choice. But it also means that if they are at one and one, who is most likely to be carrying the team into the deciding game? It's going to be the control deck with your captain and your best player. 
interesting. So it's almost like, can they get to right. his game mattering? That's going to be super interesting. Why don't we look at Brazil then in Pool A? What are they playing? Well, you know, we, we did a team deck tech with these guys yesterday. Uh, Mateos Rosetto is playing red white tokens. Uh, red green mid range for Tiago Saprito. It was very interesting to see how they split the red, two lightning strikes. Uh, across the two decks, and they also had to split the green between Tiago and Willie Adel. Willie Adel playing CDC Whip, the same deck he played in the World Championship, um, but splitting the green was pretty easy because he's playing red-green mid-range. They wanted more Elvish Mystics than they wanted Sylvan Carry Addeds, which they left in the Whip deck. Okay, and the final team in Pool A is Slovenia with Robin Dola. He is in the center seat as the captain, and I love his choice of deck. Of course you do. Of course I do. It's like, it's it's just that one little stage better than <laughs> blue black. Right, again, and again, you, you see people sort of staying, you know, if you, if you see magic and being in two aisles, like the sort of the aggro aisle and the, mm -hmm. you know, aggro side of the aisle and the control side of the aisle being much more to, to the control side here with Sidisi Whip, blue white control, and then again, Mardu midrange being the fastest deck they have on the team. All right, so that's uh, Slovenia. So that's at uh, the end of Pool A. Let's go. As you can see, the pairings are posted for the first round of Unified Team Standard. Here's Pool B. Israel, the number two seed overall, but the number one seed in this pool. South Korea will also need two and one here. Hong Kong and Greece, let's take a look at some of the decks. So why don't we take a look at what Team Israel are going to play. So again, BDM, we see the captain, right, square, and center. Yeah, Shahar Shanhar is playing Abzon Whip. Stav Brenner is playing blue black control, so again, two very controlly decks, but instead where we've seen a lot of times it's been control, control, and then mid range. Uh, Elon Boston's playing red white tokens. Uh, I believe this is the list Sam Black kind of brought to the World Championship mm -hmm. that caught everybody by surprise with Chain to the Rocks and uh, Heliot's Pilgrim. Okay. So like seven, mm -hmm. Heli seven uh, Chain to the Rocks in the deck. Right, okay. So why don't we take a look at South Korea who needs two and one. Again, the captain is in the middle. Uh, Nam Sung Wook there, Sang Yoon Kim and Joo Hyun Oh. And we've got Mono red aggro, which isn't something we've seen a lot of so no, far. No, we've mostly seen boros we're, right. we're, we're, instead of mono red. And I think part of that is because the Mardu mid range is so popular and some of those red cards want to end up there. Yes. But then this is the first time so far that we've seen black green constellation, Doomwake, Giants, and Friends. Right, right. And absolutely, I'm curious how the Mardu mid range and the mono red maybe split up the lightning strikes, which has been one of the big struggles with having two red decks. For sure. Let's get into the third and fourth seed. The third seed is Hong Kong. Uh, so this time your captain is on the right in seat C. Of course, Li Shi Chan is playing Jeskai Ascendancy. And, re and really one of the only people we've seen playing the, the not not the aggro deck that we saw Yuya Watanabe playing in the World Championship. He's playing the combo deck that he played into the top eight of Pro Tour Kansas here. Right. And of course, because Jess, <laughs> or, 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 I mean, although you've got two Jess guys on the list there, um, the fact is that Li Shi Chan is in a very different subset right. of the trade binder right. in terms of where are he my only, four he copies. He only really and, needs the ascendancies from the Jess guy cards. Quite. Okay. But it is obviously a Jess guy ascendancy deck because that's the card name. And so Jess guy aggro is not going to be like the aggro deck we've seen from Yu Yu Watanabe because it will not have the ascendancies. Okay. They are needed in Lee's deck. And then Abzan Agro in uh, seed A there for, for Gamma Yip. Right, and we've not seen a lot of that so far. Rounding out uh, group B, we have Greece. Well done to Socrates, Rosa Chaos, Bill Chronopolis, and Panagiotis Savidis. Chronopolis is an awesome name. It really is, it really is. Um, and they've gone super grind. Yeah, no, there, there's no, nothing aggro here. Mardu midrange, Teamer midrange, and then Sidisi Whip. You know, they're they're just like we want it, we want this game to go long and we're we're gonna win it, we're gonna grind it out. And they certainly did, because they were again, as I say, they got in in 32nd place at the expense ultimately of Japan yesterday. They came in as a fourth seed and they snuck in the door, and here they are, 15th. A ton of great teams are already out the door, and Greece is still in it. Great job uh, by then. I'm sure they're rooting for them. Uh, that was the first team member on any World Magic Cup team mentioned by you at the start of our broadcast. Correct. Socrates was the first word of the World Magic Cup, and he's still in it. Well done, Socrates Rosa Chaos. All right, so let's take a look at Pool C then for you. And we'll see that Mexico is the number one seed here. The Slovak Republic have slipped a little. They were the number two seed overall overnight, but they've fallen to six. 
Fortunately for them, although they've given up a one seed, they are still a two seed, which means two and one will be enough. But what an absolutely stonkingly packed group that is. Yeah. That is crazy tough. And I mean, if you're handicapping that, arguably the number one seed has got the toughest job in the room, <laughs> which is crazy. To, to, win, uh, to win two to matches win. against you know, a Pro Tour champion, former player of the year, and a Magic Online champion uh, across the, the three teams there. Quite. Just absolutely crazy. So that is Pool C. Just show us Pool D before you go, uh, if we can, to remind people who's in that. Pool D uh, gives you the Netherlands, Serbia, Hungary, and Denmark. Hungary battling back from 02, much like England. Okay, well, Pool D is where we are going to start. Um, and we're going to take a look at uh, the matchup. I believe it's going to be the Netherlands up against Denmark. Now, Frank Carsten is not given to hyperbole. This is a man who goes, yet yeah, the difference between 1.3 and 1.4 is 0.1, and that makes me very happy. He, he is a man who would play 3.7 arcbound ravagers if he could. If he could. I, I absolutely agree. So. Carsten has done everything in his power to navigate the Netherlands to here. But now it's time to step up because there's no more hiding places. It's time for the top 16 of the World Magic Cup. Let's take you down to the booth. It's showtime. 